Sorry, Zoom friends. Welcome to the service now, Zoom friends. Sorry. Hope you enjoyed the miming. <laughs> it was magnificent. You are the one at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high. Hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you, our Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater, what could separate? Russian spies and fish fries. This coming week, Christians all over the world will observe Ash Wednesday, kicking off a season that we call Lent. Uh. No. 
Lent. If you've spent any time around church in your life, you may have heard of this season. Yeah, isn't that the time before Easter where we give something up? Well, kind of, but Lent is actually much deeper than that. Lent is a season on the church calendar that stretches 40 days, from Ash Wednesday to Easter Sunday. Traditionally, Lent is treated as a time to reflect, repent, and prepare our hearts for the celebration of Easter and Christ's resurrection from the dead. But but where is Lent in the Bible? Well, the season and observation of Lent does not actually appear in Scripture. Well, that's it. I'm done. However, just because the season of Lent does not appear in Scripture doesn't mean that it's not founded on biblical principles. For example, in Greek, the season of Lent was originally referred to as tesserakosti, which means the 40. And this period of 40 days is not just some arbitrary number, but 40 is a number of deep significance in the Bible. This is the same duration of time that Moses spent on Mount Sinai and Jesus spent in the wilderness. And in both of these circumstances, both Moses and Jesus were fasting during these periods. And because of this, fasting and prayer are two of the main focuses for many believers during Lent. This is why you often see churches doing prayer journals or challenges during Lent. This is also where the idea of giving something up for Lent comes comes from. Because fasting doesn't always have to just do with food. You can fast from a certain type of food. You can fast from television or social media. In this season of Lent, I'm fasting from watching the NBA. It's a difficult sacrifice. But have you ever asked the question, why do we fast? Why do we give something up during Lent? Well, I'll tell you one thing. It's not because God wants us to be sad and grumpy all the time. And it's not so that we can brag about how we crushed Lent this year. I don't even know who would be impressed by that. But the idea of fasting or giving something up for Lent is so that we have more room to pursue God in our lives. In essence, the fasting portion of Lent means removing something to make room for the one thing. It means removing a distraction or creating more room in our lives so that we can truly pursue God and his goodness. And just like Moses' tesserakosti, or 40 days, prepared him to lead God's people across the desert, and just like Jesus' tesserakosti prepared him for his public ministry, our season of Lent is meant to prepare us to experience the full joy and celebration of Easter. Easter. So you see, Lent is not just about saying no to something. It's actually about saying no to something for a while to prepare ourselves to experience the full measure of God's yes. And so with the season of Lent starting in a few days, I want to challenge you to enter into this season resolving to pursue God with greater intensity. Maybe you'll do it through fasting, either fasting from food or something else in your life. Maybe you'll do it through consistent daily prayer, study, or reflection. Maybe you'll go above and beyond in your giving and generosity. Whatever it is for you, I want to challenge each and every one of us over the next 40 days to pursue God like never before so that we can celebrate him like never before. When I was very keen as a teenager, a few years in a row, I decided to give up chocolate for Lent, which seemed like a great idea until I remembered that my birthday falls in Lent every year, and then you're like, no chocolate cake. So um, I'm not a big fan of Lent, although I know that a lot of people find it a really helpful spiritual sort of practice. So who, who's given up things for Lent? In the past. In the past. No, I'm not saying about this year. I'm, not, I'm going to put the hard word on you later on. What sort of things have you guys given up for Lent? Someone? Anyone? What have you given up? Television. Television. Oh, that's a good one. Yes. What else have people given up? Nobody's willing to spill the beans. <laughs> we, we've done that on, on screen. Yes, we have done that. Screen time. Same sort of thing. Television. Uh, excess expenditure. Excess expenditure. You know, that's some um, more. Stop Nick's. Buying. Stop buying shoes. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Giving up food, all food for 40 days, that's, that's hardcore. That's good. Um, so we have, you know, one of my favourite things about Lent is, is Pancake Tuesday. 
and the chocolate at the end. But I think feel like it's a good time. We're coming out of it. We've had our five weeks of the spiritual pathways. So we should all know basically the, the best ways for us to pursue God. So I would want to encourage you as we're going into this Lenten season, which starts on Wednesday, to think about how you can pursue God using your own spiritual pathway. If you're a naturalist, maybe you'll go outside every day to have a walk or to have your quiet time. You'll make, sort of make a point of doing that thing. Um, I'll enthusiastically <laughs> do whatever it is that I do. Aesthetics may choose to give more things up or take things away. But I think that that's... I think in the modern world, it's not something that we do very much, that giving stuff up to make space to meet with God. So I you know, encourage you, let's do that thing if we can. Okay, I'm going to get my sheet now, see what's next. Okay, announcements. So you should have all got the, the email this week about the church camp. I am, just for a change, really excited about the church camp. Thank you to those who have signed up. If you haven't, it'd be great if you could sign up sooner rather than later, just to give us an idea of numbers, and that helps us set the final cost as well for how much it's going to cost. Again, it will be very cheap, like it was two years ago, because the church subsidises it. Um, and if you can't afford anything, that's okay too. So feel free to talk to me about that, and we can, you can come along anyway. Uh, if you didn't get the email with the link to the online form for uh, registering, please come and talk to me after church. Okay, what else is there that we need to discuss? Robin's reminding me, the, the blessing box. Uh, please give generously to the blessing box, either through money or stuff, and continue to pray for the people in our community who need, need the, the stuff that's in there, the food that's there. So talk to, to Neri or Robin if you would like to be involved, more involved in that. <clears throat> One is a suggestion I would like to make about something you can put in the little bit of space that you're making by giving something up. And it's called Lectio 365. It's an app you can download to your phone or see it on your computer. You can read it or you can listen to it. And it's not quite a guided meditation. It's more someone's, a Christian's reflection on a Bible passage, but it's presented in a slightly repeated way, just like a Lectio Divina. And um, they will have a special focus for Lent. I couldn't work out what it was this year, but they do every single day of the year. That's why it's Lectio 365. It's only 15 minutes. It doesn't require you to be lying down with your eyes closed or anything like that. You can listen to it walking. But I think it would be lovely if we um, tried to do that together. So it's Lectio 365, and I'll get Maria to send out a link to it. Um, the other thing I wanted to tell you about is the Baptist Assembly. So, <clears throat> sorry, there's a special assembly coming up um, soon. I don't know, Roger, Jenny, on the 28th, 27th, sometimes quite soon. And it's all about um, a motion that's been put forward, several motions that have been put forward by five churches in the Baptist assembly, Association. Yeah, thank you. I always call it the wrong thing. Um, and we are putting forward a position that we will oppose the motions. Um, they are ostensibly about same-sex marriage, but that's not really what it's about. I'll read um, something to you that sort of hopefully will explain it a little bit. <clears throat> Firstly, it's important to understand that while this issue purports to be about same-sex marriage, and the traditional Christian view of marriage as being between a man and a woman, it is a catalyst for a group within our Baptist churches who want to assert a particular position on this subject and enforce that position by sanctioning churches and pastors who do not agree with them. There is far more to this debate. The real underlying issue here is the Baptist distinctive, the autonomy of the local church, and the decision-making relationship between local churches and the association. On the one hand, we have the current and traditional position that each individual Baptist church is responsible for making its own decisions and policies within its own constitution. The association is a loose group of like-minded, autonomous entities with a role primarily of mutual help, support, and guidance. The association has no authoritarian role in telling churches what to do or think, and even less a role in sanctioning those who do not conform to a central policy directive. It is our view that this current situation, has, as it has evolved over time, which enables each Baptist church to develop its own unique character 
values and identity, while also recognising and celebrating the diversity of its membership and their various faith journeys. <clears throat> the proposals before the Assembly take away this sense of autonomy and replace it with an alternative scenario, where a group of Baptists from one or more churches can persuade or enforce a particular policy or set of policies through the Assembly or General Council, possibly from a minority position, and having succeeded in getting this ruling adopted, can enforce that practice on the denomination as a whole and potentially against the wishes of other congregations. It is a scenario which by definition encourages conformity, not diversity, legalism, not freedom. Furthermore, the promotion of sanctions against churches or pastors for non-compliance introduces a whole new realm of authoritarianism, potentially bullying attitudes, centralized control, all of which fly in the face of our historic Baptist principles. It is our fear that such a regime would lead to considerable increase in the numbers of people, clergy and lay, leaving the denomination for other places where freedom of conscience are still valued and preserved. We are not advocating on whether same-sex marriage is acceptable or not. Um, we want to say that we should not move as an association to a position where we are telling people what to do and kicking them out if they don't do what we want. So I hope that you are all okay with that, but I wanted to let you know the, what was coming up and what we were doing about it. Thank you. Heavens, that was heavy, wasn't it? I think we should pray for the Baptist Assembly. We will pray when we pray after this, but I think in our own time as well, we should remember to pray for unity and freedom. Um, is there any other announcements that anybody wants to bring? Matt? Come to a mic, yeah, because people at home otherwise feel left out. Just come and speak to this one. Yeah. Um, so on Friday, the Friday Fun Group are going to be doing Pancake Friday because we don't meet on Tuesdays and I'm not going to do stuff on Tuesday. So come on down on Friday. We will be in the hall and we'll be doing making pancakes. I think we will probably end up using our massive paella pan again to do big pancake. So, get on down. <laughs> um, 6.30 Friday in there. I'll send out an email and all that sort of stuff. That's great. Okay, if that's all the announcements, yes? Okay, well now the Sunday school and the youth will go out. And then the next section is exciting. We're going to have a, a brief commissioning of Neri, who's taken up the role as the chaplain at uh, ABCC. So Lydia and Neri and whomever else is involved, do you want to come up for that? Nerida, could you come and explain what's going to be happening so that the congregation knows what your job will be? Yes, I will. Um, I've recently taken, oh, I've recently come off the Committee of Management. As you know, you might remember that happening at the end of um, last year, towards the end of last year, after 18 years of service on the, um, on the committee, um, because I felt God was calling me to take up the role as chaplain in the centre. And it's kind of exciting and a little bit daunting at the same time. <laughs> but um, since starting, um, I've been just sort of spending time and immersing myself or trying to a little bit by, you know, sitting in the playground with the kids and just being there and playing with them, which is fun. And they're already asking the big questions like, why is your hair so curly? <laughs> <laughs> um, what are you here for? Um, and when I said, I'm the chaplain, the little girl says, what's a chaplain? So I tried to explain what a chaplain was and I kind of fumbled with it a bit because it's kind of awkward to explain. Um, but basically I said, well, I'm here to spend time with you guys and to share about God with you and to be um, supportive to the staff and to the parents and yeah, that's why I'm here. 
So that's kind of what I'll be doing. And um, yeah, I'd really value your prayer and support. Um, and that's, I guess, why we're doing what we're doing right now. Um, just to make you all aware of, of what I'm doing and, um, and just pray for God's inner working with me to work outwardly in our childcare community. And I, I really feel it's a significant role. Um, I think we have one family here that comes to our centre. Um, and also we have one person present today who came to our centre many years ago and now is a staff member there and comes to our church regularly. And I'm not sure if you know who that, but I don't want to, that might be, but do you want to put your hand up, Jade? <laughs> <laughs> so that's really exciting and I think that's what I'd love our church to be in the future, a whole heap of people who are young people or adults growing up who've maybe been um, children at our childcare centre and come here and make this church their church family. And um, that's my prayer for our centre. And, um, and I just pray that you'll help, pray that you know, God will help me to find creative ways to engage with the children and the families. Um, one little idea God's given me is to pick up the ukulele again and to learn the kids' songs um, on the ukulele. So the little songs like, um, I've forgotten all the songs now, <laughs> but all the God songs like, um, um, yeah, similar, yeah. So I'm starting on that and it's not too hard, thankfully. So, and I'm hoping that that'll be a really great way to engage with the kids. And um, I've had one interaction with a parent already who's really interested in coming to the church and they've got a young baby and a toddler. Um, and I'm also trying to follow up with a staff member who's been on workers' comp for a long time for an injury. So yeah, just it's a very diverse kind of role, but I just, yeah, pray for, for God's hand in that. And also protection over me and my family. Um, I guess it's always, um, Satan will find little weak points in your life to attack when you're getting involved greater in ministry. So my family has several weak points. So please pray for protection over us and, um, and the centre and the committee as well. And thanks. Thanks, Nerida. Hello, my name is Jodie Goldney and I'm the chairperson of the Asheville Baptist Child Care Centre. Uh, and I was, I'm very excited to be up here um, helping to um, inaugurate and welcome uh, Nerida into the a role officially as chaplain of the centre. I was just thinking of some metaphors or um, ways of describing Nerida that stem from the Bible and it's I think a, a very easy thing to do. Uh, Nerida I think is she is like salt, she is uh, a still small voice and I think she very importantly she is like the beginning of a wave and I think you can all reflect on how integrated and how um, much leadership Nerida already provides in our church. Uh, she has led so much community service and I think um, is, is our Goliath in that space. If, or maybe our David. She's our David. It's probably a better, better way of thinking about it. She's our David in that space. And, and um, I think about Nerida and I think that she's someone who makes me want to be a better Christian. And I, I look around the church and I think that um, many people have that same perspective. So she's incredibly well placed to take up the role as chaplain and to share that um, vision, that um, active um, leadership and um, display of what it means to be a Christian in this world. So uh, we are incredibly excited to have Nerida with us. Yay. Uh, I want to share that it's uh, a particular delight to me that Nerida is stepping into this role um, for many reasons, um, Nerida herself, but also the fact that she's a member of this congregation being a chaplain at the Child Care Centre, which is what happened originally and I think is vital to keep the connections going between the Child Care Centre, which we've set up, but which is autonomous, although we're obviously very involved. Um, and now again, we're going to have this strong connection with that community and this community. So that's particularly, particularly delightful. Um, Nerida, I'm going to get you to come here so I can... Yes. 
I'm allowed to lay hands on you, am I, in this COVID time? Yes. And um, yeah, I'd like to pray. Lord God, send your spirit into Nerida. Give her bravery and wisdom. May she see what you want her to see in the people and circumstances in the child care centre. Lord, may you protect her family. May you put a barrier between her, her family, and those outside forces which want to distract her or crush her or cause problems there. Lord God, protect her, inspire her, comfort her, and make her your hands and feet in the child care center. And may this church support her and give her all the help that she needs. Lord God, we ask in great confidence in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Great. We're going to continue in prayer. Does anybody else have any prayer requests or praise points they'd like to share? No? Great. Anything from people at home? Did anybody type anything in? Nope. Okay, let's pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for all the good things that you give us. Thank you for the many blessings that you've given to this church and the many ministries that have flowed out of those blessings. And we thank you that we're here together meeting in your name without masks for the first time in a long time. We thank you for the, the freedom and the blessing we have to meet together. We pray for our friends in Victoria who are in lockdown again and other places all around the world who are really struggling with corona. Lord, we pray that you might continue to work to get the, the vaccinations out uh, and encourage people to have them. But Lord, we pray that you might be working to, to stop the spread of this disease, that you might be working to bring nations together and that you might be working to bring hearts to you as well through this difficulty. Lord, we thank you for the blessing box and what a true blessing it has been to people in our community over the last year. I pray, Lord, that you would continue to use it and you would help remind us, move our hearts uh, to give generously towards that. Thank you for... Robin and Neri and Charity and others who have been helping to keep it going. Thank you for their service to us and to the community. Lord, we want to pray for the Baptist Assembly. Lord, we thank you that as Baptists we are part of a system which is one that encourages freedom and unity. Lord, we pray that that might continue, that you might help uh, the meeting uh, later this month to be one where there is love, love shown for each other, even when there's differing opinions and differing views. And we pray that you might be sovereign over that whole meeting. Lord, we thank you again for Neri and her. She is our shining golden caregiver. We pray that you would bless her and use her in, our, uh, in the child care centre to bring families into this centre, uh, sorry, into our church, but also to bring people to close to you, to know you and to find new life. We thank you for her. And Lord, we pray for the season of Lent that's starting. Lord, we pray that you would draw each of us closer to you, that you would help us to find ways to make space in our busy lives, to draw near to you, to prioritise time with you, and uh, to use the different gifts and uh, inclinations that each of us have, that we're all different, help us to use those different things to bless those around us, be they our family or our friends or our wider community. Lord, thank you for the amazing love that you have for us. Thank you for that. We remember that every year at Easter and every Sunday as we join together. Lord Jesus, we are always amazed when we remember how much you've done for us, how lost we were and how much you did, how far you came to bring us back like lost sheep. Lord, thank you that we are yours and we are known by your name and we're loved and held safe. In your precious name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Okay, Bible reading. The Bible reading comes from the book of Luke, chapter 14, uh, reading from the new RSVP. Uh, Jesus heals the man with dropsy. On one occasion, when Jesus was going to the house of a leader of the Pharisees to eat a meal on the Sabbath, they were watching him closely. 
Just then, in front of him, there was a man who had dropsy. And Jesus asked the lawyers and Pharisees, is it lawful to cure people on the Sabbath or not? But they were silent. So Jesus took him and healed him and sent him away. Then he said to them, if one of you has a child or an ox that is fallen into a well, will you not immediately pull it out on a Sabbath day? And they couldn't reply to this. When he noticed how the guests chose the places of honour, he told them a parable. When you were invited by someone to a wedding banquet, do not sit at the place of honour in case someone more distinguished than you has been invited by your host. And the host who invited both you, <coughs> both of you may come and say to you, give this person your place. And then in disgrace, you would start to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go and sit down at the lowest place so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Uh, then you'll be honoured in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled and those who humble themselves will be exalted. He said also to the one who had invited him, when you give a luncheon or a dinner, do not invite your friends or your brothers or your relatives or rich neighbours in case they may invite you in return and you'd be repaid. But when you give a banquet, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind and you'll be blessed because they cannot repay you for you'll be repaid at the resurrection of the righteous. One of the dinner guests on hearing this said to him, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Then Jesus said to him, someone gave a great dinner and invited many. At the time for the dinner, he sent his slave to say to those who'd been invited, come, for everything's ready now. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said to him, I've bought a piece of land and I must go, and go out and see it. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I've bought five yoke of oxen and I'm going to try them out. Please accept my apologies. Another said, I've just been married and therefore I cannot come. So the slave returned and reported this to his master. Then the owner of the house became angry and said to his slave, go out at once into the streets and lanes of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. And the master said to the slave, go out into the roads and lanes and compel people to come in so that my house may be filled. For I tell you, none of those who were invited will taste my dinner. Now, large crowds were traveling with him and he turned and said to them, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, this fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Thanks, Beverly. Um, if you feel like standing up, now is a good time to stand up. If you feel like you need to stretch your legs and get the blood flowing and do the things, we're going to sing again in a minute, which you can stay standing for if you want to, or you can sit down, but feel free to get going. I'd just like to give a shout out to Beverly for crushing that reading. Well done, Beverly. <laughs> Yeah. 
Morning all. Brett, could you just go on to the first, the picture slide, please? Have you seen these? Name sticks. Used a lot in primary school classrooms particularly, but also in high schools. A phenomenon that is increasingly common, over, become increasingly common over the last decade or so. It's a fairly straightforward kind of process. The idea is that you take a stick for each child in the class and you put their name on it. You can see this is an American one. You've got Peyton down the front there, that is, you won't find an Australian patent, I don't think. You, there's also Evan in there with double N, which, what were they thinking? There probably should be class, compulsory classes for expectant parents, really, about name giving. Anyway, so this is an American example. It's actually a first year teacher, this one, very, the blog post here, very keen about it. This is a very beautiful example. And the idea is that you use these instead of asking kids to put their hands up. Because in a classroom, any selection method you use is going to have, uh, it's pitfalls. 
If you ask kids to put their hand up, what happens invariably is the same kids put their hands up all the time. And the teacher, if they're not careful, will just pick the kid that you know is going to give you the right answer. I mean, you go to Hamish and you say, Hamish, and you know Hamish will deliver the goods and the class can keep moving forward and, that, and that's beautiful. You don't want to do that. You want to kind of make sure that everyone's participating. And so this method is, rather than having hands up, you pick a, a random stick out of the, the pot and the, the kid has to be vigilant. The kid has to have been listening before because suddenly, you know, they, they're called upon and there's no way to hide. You also don't pick the kid that's put their hand up to go to the toilet, which is more common than you would think. Now, as I said, every, every selection method has its pitfalls because, of course, the, the trouble is that you, you pick a kid that's got nothing. And due process is that you work with that kid and you say, Elliot, have a think what we've just been talking about. What do you think the answer might be? And it slows everything down, which is, of course, why teachers lie, which I personally have an ethical problem with. They pick out, they pick out the... the the stick, they see Elliot and they say, oh, I'm not going to go with Elliot, I'm going to go with Joe. And it says, Jody, which is why you've got to have sticks that are all the same. It's no good having a trap for young players, don't put coloured sticks in because kids know what colour their stick is and they know that you're fudging. So if you are going to fudge, it might. Now, I say this as a, as a starting point by means of analysis because I said every selection method has its pitfalls. Brett, could you go on to the next slide? Because today I had. Oh, it's, it's lost the numbers. There were numbers against that list there. It was, an, it was a numbered list, but that's okay. You can imagine them there. I had five criteria at, uh, on which to kind of pick this sermon. It was relatively short notice. I thought, well, look, let's talk about Jesus because so rarely we do. Explicitly, you know, often we're off in the Old Testament or whatever, which is fine. Let, let's try and have a look at a parable or two because so often we don't. Let's go with Luke because I've got some commentaries on Luke and that might, you know, bail me out if I get stuck. Um, let, let's have something to do with Lent and let's, if we can, have it to do with, something to do with life being a bit difficult because certainly for our family at the moment it is a bit difficult and, and so often the case for everyone else as well. Now, you've got to be careful what you wish for because where, where we've ended up with this, oh, these notes are upside down, no wonder I'm looking, I'm looking at the back page and thinking that's not helping me. Uh, because no matter what you pick out of Luke, you're kind of in trouble against this criteria. For a start, the parables in Luke are often about money, which is a bit confronting. And I thought, oh, heavens. You know, so there's the rich fool who builds massive barns. There's the unforgiving servant who doesn't... Re you remember that one? Who doesn't forgive another servant for a smaller debt when he's been given the, forgiven a big debt. There's a parable of the talents. You know, there's money and what do you do with them? Then, of course, there's the encounter with the rich young ruler. The other thing in, in Luke is that there's the, there are often parables of reversal. You, you know that idea? So the character that you don't expect to get the tick from Jesus does. And so the tax collector and, and the publican, or as it's often called, the rich man and the beggar Lazarus, prodigal son and his brother. Even things like the lost sheep and the lost coin, which look pretty kind of innocuous, you know, Sunday school happy stories. They're about Jesus putting, putting the boot into the, the Pharisees for rejecting the, the outcasts in society. So that didn't help either. And then, and then, the parables in Luke are often really hard to interpret. Looking at you, parable of the shrewd manager, you know that one where, you're like, a, and I thought, so steadily, I just tell him, oh, no, I can't do that, oh, I can't do that one, oh, that one, that, that one needs to be a part of a series. So unless you wanted the 842nd sermon on the parable of the sower, it was going to be a rough ride this morning. We were going to, we were going to lose a bit of skin off the knees today uh, and, and even the parable of the sower has got the bit about being choked by riches and you know the th cares of the world. So what we've ended up with is Luke 14. We're going to focus on the last passage. You remember from if you were paying attention to what was written, read by Beverly before, there was Jesus at a dinner party, which we'll talk about briefly, and then he talks to the crowds. It's got Jesus, tick. It's got Luke, tick. It's got parables, lots of ticks there. It relates to Lent, sort of tickish, and it relates to life being difficult. But the result is it's a bit in our face. So please don't shoot the messenger. Jesus said it. Uh, let's pray and then we'll get stuck in. Heavenly Father, we do pray that you can speak to us this morning. Pray that your truth may shine through all the words uh, and that it might be a blessing to all of us who are hearing. Amen. All right. Next slide, please, Brett.
Now, we, as I said, we're starting, re we're really looking at verse 25, but let's, it seemed a bit rough to drop straight into Jesus saying, you can't be my disciple unless... So we're, we're easing our way in very quickly by just thinking about the dinner party. And it's got to be said that Jesus in this context is not at his most agreeable. He's not just trying to make it all go smoothly. Uh, click again for me, Brett, please. Um, you're going to be rapid firing for a bit. All right, that should have a number. Uh, it starts off with Jesus healing the person with dropsy. Dropsy is kind of a swelling illness. And of course, it's on the parable, oh, it's on the Sabbath. Uh, and so nothing ever good happens when Jesus does something noble on the Sabbath and the Pharisees are around. And so then he tells a parable, you remember, teasing out their inconsistency. He says, basically, if you've got a child or an ox that falls into a well, won't you get them out? Well, why shouldn't I heal on the Sabbath? Okay. Dinner party, probably just feeling a little bit tense. Next slide. Then Jesus notes what the guests did. The guests all picked the place of honour. So he tells another kind of parable and basically says, when you're invited by someone to a wedding banquet, draw the dots, we're talking about what's going on here as well, just in case you're not, the guests aren't making, uh, making that connection, don't pick the place of honour because someone more important will come along and how will that work out for you? You'll be down the bottom, you're much better off to humble yourself. Okay, fair enough. Third slide, Brett. Then he has a crack at the host. Um, and in fact, if you look at the Greek and the way it's structured, the, it, the, the language used, there's all, there's all these markers that kind of parallel. There's a, he talks about guest behaviour and then he talks about host behaviour and it's a sort of a, a mirror thing. And he basically says to the host that when you invite a dinner party, a luncheon or a dinner, don't invite your friends or brothers, uh, but it, rich neighbours, but rather, as he said, to invite the poor, the crippled, the lame and the blind. Well, then someone obviously tries to get it back on track, Brett again, please, and says, oh, look, it, it hasn't come onto the screen. Look, it's, it's formatted, funnily. Someone responds with a rather pious comment there, blessed is anyone who will eat bread in the kingdom of God. Uh, something's happened there, Brett. Now, you would think that that would be fairly unproblematic, but no, it's game on. Because Jesus then tells the longest parable of the lot of them, basically telling a story about how someone has organised an event and it's based on the classic model in the ancient world of the double or even triple invite. You would send an invitation beforehand saying, you know, as we do, it's, perhaps we don't do it on little embossed cards anymore, but you, you let people know, hey, the birthday party's on the 13th, pencil it in, you know, put it in your diary. But in the ancient world, what they would do is that they would expedite that on the day by saying, because they weren't exactly sure when everything would be right. It might depend on the harvest. It might depend on, on getting the, the oxen delivered or whatever. So on the day, they would send a reminder, hey, it's all about next, next one up, Brett, just there, and just hold that, beautiful. Uh, uh, and on the day, they would expedite and get the people to come. Now, what happens is, and we miss this because of the cultural context, but these are all just lame excuses. They are akin to, oh, sorry, I'm washing my hair. You know, I've just bought an oxen and I'm going to try them out. Nobody bought, bought an oxen in the old in the oxen in the old world without trying them out before. You know, the first one was actually land. No one in, doesn't inspect the land before they buy it. So the person, these series of people, are just making entirely false uh, claims why they can't come. And then, of course, there's the one about being married. And again, we need to understand without getting to the depths of that that that's a, like a fake excuse. And so the master. You guessed it, in the parable invites once again the poor, the crippled, the blind and the lame. Now this of course is highly offensive to his listeners because Jesus is making the point, and they would have got this, particularly to the Jewish leaders, that they're kind of rejecting God's invitation to them. All the way through the Old Testament you've got the prophets saying you should be doing this and, and pushing back against God and now Jesus comes as the ultimate prophet and they, they basically, of course as we know, end up killing him. Now, pausing, just as we're going along, one, one opportunity for us to reflect is this. Are we too agreeable? There are some of us who, by nature, are not agreeable enough and spend our life trying to become more gracious, more irenic, peace-loving, more kind of uh, gentle in the way that we deal with other people. 
On the other end of the spectrum, there are those of us who are, who are delightful in every context, but perhaps don't step up to the plate in a non-gender specific sense, don't man up, sorry for the, it's a gender laden term, uh, and, and confront things that are wrong. And when we, it's so often, I think, the case that we remember the gentle Jesus, meek and mild kind of vibe, you know, and remember the, all, all the injunctions to be the fruits of the spirit and gentleness and kindness, but it's just worth noting that that wasn't always what Jesus did. And to that end, I wrote to a government minister this week. And, uh, okay. Now, this is all a very wild ride, but to be honest, it's not very confronting to us, really, is it? You know, nobody, nobody's sitting here going, oh, you know, I'm starting to feel really, really uncomfortable. You know, we can say, oh, Jesus, we would have cheered when you healed, healed the man with dropsy. We, we would not have been troubled by legalism around the Sabbath. We're feeling good, aren't we? We're feeling good about that. Oh, Jesus, we always take the humble place. Quick check of the memory, but we're not too troubled here, yes? We're not feeling overwhelmed by our overweening pride. Oh, Jesus, we always invite our non-friends to dinner. There's nervous shuffling at the feet at this point. Well, we might have planned to, and of course some of us do, some of us do. And, and Jesus, on more confident ground now, we certainly understand the priority to accept your invitation into the kingdom of God. We're not rejecting you. There's a bit of alarm. There is a bit of alarm, isn't there, about the, the humble places. We have to kind of go, oh, maybe I probably should have been a bit more humble then. There's a bit of alarm about in the kind of how we hang out with people, but we're not deeply unsettled. But then, bam, it's... Floodlight in the eyes. It's like Bono holding the big light up on the edge in the Rattle and Hum tour. You know, just absolutely overwhelming light because suddenly we are confronted. And if we're not confronted, we're not reading it right. If we're just comforted by the next passage, we're not getting the point. So we're going to slow down, we're going to calm down, we're going to drill down and see what it has to say. Can you flip on to, this is, this is your last clicking, that's going to stay up for the rest of our duration. Now the last section, and the section that we're focusing on today, I've got some headings there. Love and hate. Now Jesus, now large crowds were travelling with him, we've left the dinner party and we're out with the crowds now, and in fact, in terms of the flow of Luke, this is regarded as a new section, and pretty much from here on to the end of the Gospel of Luke, which obviously flows onto Acts, it's like a double act, but, no pun intended, um, but the last section is all about discipleship, and this is regarded as the hinge moment, yes? But it flows out of what we've been reading. Now, large crowds were travelling with him, that's Jesus, and he turned to them and said, whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, it's like, what the heck, wife and children, Brothers and sisters, yes, even life itself cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you intending to build a tower does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has or she has enough to complete it. Otherwise, when he or she has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him or her saying this fellow, or lassie, began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot then, while the other is far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, underlining it again, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Now, first technical point, there was a period of time when people would try to, including scholars, would try to weasel out of this by saying that there was a kind of a two-tier system. There are your rank-and-file Christians and then the keen beans, the overly earnest, the, the superstars, and they were the disciples. Like, discipleship was like... like if, if you want to go the extra mile following Jesus, then you become a disciple. Otherwise, it's okay, you just accept the grace of, and love of God and you become a... That, it's almost certainly is wrong. When Jesus is talking about disciples, he's talking about people who want to follow him, which is us. 
So, where do we go with this? Well, let me say, I put do the math because it seemed funny and I had Peyton in mind still. Um, that's obviously do the maths in Australia. Uh, the parables are actually the easy bit. Jesus tells two of them, probably to underline the point that he's making, but essentially they make the same point, don't they? The parables teach us that you need to calculate, you need to do the math to work out whether you've got what it takes to get the job done. If you don't have enough cash for the building resources, don't start building the tower. If you don't have a big enough army, then don't go into the war. Try and get out of the war. Now, there's some slight difference. Building a tower is voluntary. The war is you're being attacked. So, you know, are you initiating or are you responding? But broadly speaking, it's the same point, isn't it? What's alarming, though, is Jesus is saying that we need to do, and I'm inviting us to do again this morning, the same kind of calculation about what it takes to follow Jesus and be his disciple. Because according to this passage, you're supposed to hate your nearest and dearest, you're supposed to hate your own life and carry the cross, symbol of heading to your death, we'll get to that in a second, and you're supposed to give away all your possessions. And it's like, ah, oh, right, that's a bit full on. Now, on the one hand, I think we can quite comfortably say that this does not all need to be taken exactly literally. I, think it, I, I don't think we're weaseling, I don't think we're fudging, I think it, that's totally okay. Jesus is teaching about love elsewhere, and it's this principle of scripture interpreting scripture, yes, standard, you know, ever since way back when, that's been the, the way to go, the reformers obviously did it as well in the Reformation. Jesus is teaching about love elsewhere, clearly shows us that the issue here is about relative priority rather than an endorsement of hatred. Jesus is not endorsing hatred. For example, at the Last Supper, Jesus says, by this all men will know, or women as well, will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The two greatest commandments are loving God and loving your neighbour as yourself. His teaching about marriage precludes you to conclude that you're supposed to hate your wife. And Mrs Potton wouldn't let me anyway. Uh, likewise, teaching about children and suffer not the little children, let them come to me, says that we're not supposed to hate children. And Jesus clearly loved his mother because when he's on the cross, he commends her into the care of John the disciple, yes? So Jesus clearly isn't telling us that we've got to hate. He also said that he'd come to give us life in all its fullness. So he's not endorsing some kind of death cult here. And the notion of giving up all our possessions cannot mean that no Christian can own anything. For a start, it wasn't true in the New Testament. Uh, and secondly, it's really hard to kind of conceive how that possibly could work, yes? I mean, if nothing else, we need clothes, and if for no other reason beyond decency, just to stay warm. You know, so this is, there has to be a sense in which we're not taking this overly prescriptively, literally. The point that Jesus is making is that your love and commitment to him and to God must be so great, all your heart and soul and mind and strength, that in comparison, the love that you have for your nearest and dearest is akin to hatred, yes? Now, for people in less blessed cultures than ours, and there's, there's pitfalls in our culture as well, but in, in other contexts, it may actually mean that they may have to allow themselves to be forsaken by their family. They may have to leave their family. The choice to follow Jesus may mean leaving another religion. But in and of itself, this isn't... So it may actually be very applicably um, relevant for, for people in that context. But it's not a slavish literalism here. But, and it's a big but... The fact that it's not slavishly literal doesn't let us off the hook. We could spend weeks and weeks, you could write a, there's a seed of a PhD trying to work out what it means to take up your cross, yes? Where Jesus says, um, under life and death there, whoever not, does not carry the cross and follow me cannot my, be my disciple. There are, for those who are technically minded, interpretive issues, hermeneutical horizons, if you like, because when Jesus says this, he hasn't gone to the cross himself, yes? But when Luke writes it, Jesus has. And so you go, well, hold on, how much do you, how much do you feed back into this, the notion that Jesus does go, go to the cross? Because when the hearers heard this in the first instance, they, they wouldn't have got that. But the essence of it would almost certainly have been the idea that the cross was a symbol of death. 
yes? Ever-present terror of the Roman occupation of Israel, Palestine at that time. Jesus is saying, you have to consider yourself dead. In the words of Romans, a living sacrifice. Yes, you remember that phrase? You have to accept that all your previous hopes and aspirations and things that you long for and kind of, you know, dream, that actually they're surrendered to God. You know that song, I surrender all? That's the essence of it. it, it you surrender your claim to your life going the way that you want it to be. Now, if you're not feeling uncomfortable, it's a kind of deep internal detachment, a letting go of your vested interest that things work out the way that you planned. And so the question is then, what do we think we signed up for? When I first became a Christian, I, I became a, a disciple, to use the, the terminology, when I was sort of 17, no, I actually just turned 18, first year uni. And there was a lovely lady uh, in our church, I knew her, um, but she had stopped coming to church and she, her explanation to me, and it was quite confronting at the time, was God, God just hasn't answered my prayers. I had a relationship where I could talk things through quite honestly with her, even though she was you know, 25 years older than me or something. Uh, she had been quite badly sinned against. Um, the church leadership in that context had been pretty rubbish supporting her, so I could understand why she was uh, upset. There is a book, and I've mentioned it before, and I'll probably mention it again because it was so, uh, I find it so helpful, a book by a guy called Richard Niebuhr, brother of Reinhold Niebuhr, who, who said, um, did the serenity prayer, and it's called Christ and Culture. And what he does is he basically looks at the way that Christians historically have tied together the notion of following Christ and the expectations of the culture around them. And on one end of the spectrum, you've got the kind of brethren, closed brethren idea that you, Christ against culture. There's the culture, you cut yourself off from the world and you, 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 you kind of live in your own kind of Christian, Christian bubble. I need to stay close to the mic for the people at home. Uh, on the other end of the spectrum is Christ as the fulfilment of culture, that, that everything that your society values and hopes for and regards as the highest good, in Christ you will be blessed by that. That's the essence of the prosperity gospel, yes? That God... And, and this is one of the things that in Luke is being hammered all the way, you know, because God, there was the assumption that God obviously liked the rich people because he'd given them so much money, he must like them. Uh, and Jesus is pushing against that. So the question then becomes for us, what do we think we've signed up for? Because life is difficult. It's the first line of The Road Less Travelled by Scott Peck, yes. Um, he was on the road to becoming a Christian at that time. To what extent are we expecting everything to work out nicely for us? I say this because, uh, in part because uh, our family uh, has, has some circumstances at the moment that, that are quite trying and things are not going quite the way that you would hope or expect them to be. And to take up your cross is actually, in, in part, to let go of the expectations that everything it's going to be great. We're off to see our strapping six foot five nephew, 29, who's, who's got motor neurone disease. We've got stuff closer to home. Some of you know about that as well. And so, you know, this is where I think at the end of Habakkuk, you, you have to, the gospel has to make sense when Rome is burning, when the Huns are coming over the hill, when people are dying, when injustice is happening. The gospel and what you've signed on for still has to make sense at that point, when God isn't answering your prayer, when the pain is not abating, when the wrong people are getting promotions or the plaudits. In Habakkuk, through, though the fig tree does not blossom and no fruit is on the vine. Forget the jaunty tune that this was set to, a fun tune completely at odds with what's being said. And the produce of the olive fails and the fields yield no food. Though the flock is cut off from the fold and there's no herd in the stalls. In other words, when you're about to starve, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will exult in the God of my salvation. 
God, the Lord, is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer and makes me tread upon the heights. Which brings us to the spiritual discipline of Lent. Great video. I'd feel thoroughly overshadowed if I wasn't so much better looking than he was. Uh, Lent is meant to foster this internal detachment, yes? Yes. It, it, for us to prioritise the kingdom of God. Lent is a spiritual discipline. You know, we've been thinking about the means, means of grace, if you like, the various temperaments over the last five weeks. My suggestion off the back of this passage here is, what do we need? And I'm confronted by this myself, and I've been thinking deeply about it over the last number of days. Do we need Lent for us at the moment, at this time, as a spiritual discipline? Or do we need Repentance. Do we need Lent as a spiritual discipline or do we need repentance? It depends how grievous you think the problem is. When you take the car to the mechanic, there's an assessment. If the car is basically sound, there's a bit of a tune-up, yes? Tinkle. If there's a major problem, though, the measures are much more drastic. You know, they'll drop a new, new engine in, recondition in. Lent is a tune-up. Repentance is akin to a new engine. Something's majorly out of whack. If you go to the doctor, like I'm doing Jesus' double, double parable, so you, look at As, uh, you go to the GP, if you've got a tumour, you don't want the GP to suggest a new exercise regime and cut out the fatty meats in your diet. You want the referrals to get the biopsies. You want the thing cut out. You want to see whether you've got to have chemo or radiotherapy. You know, like you want, you want the whole works. So let's conclude then by thinking about Jesus' talking about possessions here in particular. Uh, this passage is obviously very confronting uh, and it's true in Luke in general because we are so well off. Our, li- our lives are so blessed. We've got so much stuff so many possessions, some of us are more wealthy than others, some of us have better than others, and all of us have got difficulties to bear. It used to be called the cross that you bear, I think that's bad use of the term, but, but we all enjoy an incredible standard of living. But wealth is not the only focus here, although it's clearly one in Luke, because, because our blessings are such that it allows us to have these kind of addictions to self, to self-improvement, to entertainment, to screen time, to self-actualization. You know, I spend far too much time wondering whether I'm going to get time to work on my effort to learn Arabic. I don't need to learn Arabic. But, but it, you, know, it's, you know, it's self as project to some extent. You know, Let's go on chess.com and see if I can lose to somebody in Pakistan again. You know, like... And the... Any preaching of the gospel, it said, that doesn't confront the major spirit of the age isn't really, it said, any preaching of the gospel at all. What is the major spirit of the age? Well, it's the spirit of self, isn't it? It's, the, it's obviously got a materialistic element to it. Perhaps it's always been that way. Credentialism. Improvement. Leisure. Now, it's temptingly convenient for the comfortable, like me and perhaps some of us, to read this passage and think it's all just about internal detachment. And it's okay to have lots of stuff as long as you feel okay about it. It's okay as, you, as long as you tithe 10%. But, the, but, but can these parables of uh, Luke, and you can go and read the other ones, and can this passage simply be just about internal detachment? We know it's not slavishly literal, we've established that, but is it just about internal detachment? detachment. I mean, when Jesus talks about inviting people to to dinner, and he says, look, you shouldn't just invite your friends, you should invite your your non-friends, poor, crippled, blind and lame, we don't say, oh, that was just a kind of an internal detachment, you know, you can have your friends there, but you just don't really think of them. No, clearly we take at that point, well, we should be inviting those people. So when Jesus talks about some of this stuff in terms of possessions, 
do we perhaps let ourselves off the hook? If we don't accept the internal detachment line in terms of hospitality, should we accept it in terms of wealth and materialism? And so it comes to Lent. Is Lent some time for fine-tuning, for tinkering around the edges, or is it actually time for some repentance and serious rethinking? If you have a luxury yacht, which some of us do, so I pick it, is it a case that I think I should spend less time on the luxury yacht during Lent? Or do you think, maybe I don't need a luxury yacht at all? And I leave us with this. John Wesley, obviously founder of Methodism and one of the greats of, of English spiritual heritage, when he was at Oxford, of course, he's in his room and he's just bought a couple of pictures and he put them up on his wall. And in walks what he calls a servant girl who's clearly near destitute. She's got a job, but, and he thinks, to use my language, what the heck am I doing? I've just adorned my wall when this woman does, barely has enough to eat. And of course he famously then set his standard of expenditure at a fixed point and as his fame and wealth increased, he kept it the same. You know, and it is, it, the figures I saw, and these are dated, was that in American figures, he, when his wealth got to about 160,000 US dollars per annum, he was still spending as if he had 20. And he just gave the rest away. So, as we go into Lent, let's be, let's be real with ourselves, and, and, and I am with myself as well. Is it, is it a tune-up or is it repentance? Is, is, it, is it a Lenten discipline for a short period of time? Or is the Lord actually calling us to make more fundamental changes in our lives? Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that uh, you have died for us and that you accept us even in our brokenness. But we do come to you as wannabe disciples. Uh, we know we are there through what you've done for us, but we ask that you might take our discipleship and speak truth to our mind and help us to follow you in a way that brings you glory. In Jesus' name. Amen.
in our blessing from Revelation. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Have a peace to love and serve the Lord. Have a wonderful week.